Hey, it's Moser, and we are going to do some interactive notes on populations and population growth curves and how populations change. So before you start this video, you should have already made a copy of the interactive notes. You can either open the slides and make a copy of that, which you can then edit, or you can open the PDF and you can draw right on top of it. Okay, so just like we started every matrix with some vocabulary, I want to establish some vocabulary before we go too far with these. Now, we're going to start with these three, birth rate, death rate, and growth rate. And if you think about it for a minute, you can probably actually figure out what these mean on your own. You know, the birth rate, I don't know, how many births they have in a population. The death rate, how many deaths. And the growth rate, how fast a population grows. That is all true, but we have some sort of numeric formulas that we use for these. So the birth rate is the number of births per 100 individuals in the population that happens every year. The death rate, well, what do you think that is? Well, yeah, it's the same thing, except now we're talking about the number of deaths per 100 individuals that happen in the population every year. So you might think that the growth rate is, you know, some relationship between the birth rate and the death rate, and you'd be right. The growth rate is the birth rate minus the death rate divided by 100. So it's sort of like the percent, of the, the percent growth. Okay, now let's think about a few things. What would it take for the population to grow? Which rate would have to be higher, birth rate or death rate? You got it firmly in mind? Okay. When the birth rate is higher than the death rate, we see a population that is growing. What does that look like? Well, it looks like this, or it looks like this, or it can even look like this. It doesn't matter how fast that line is going up, but the number of individuals in the population is increasing over time. Obviously, the slope of this line tells us how fast it's increasing. A is very rapid growth, B is sort of medium growth, and C, that's our slow but steady. So what, a pop, what about a population that's shrinking? What would the relationship between birth and death rate be there? When the death rate is higher than the birth rate, we see the population start to shrink. What does that look like? Well, it could look like this, which is pretty catastrophic, fast decline. It could look like this, a sort of gradually shrinking population, or it could even look like this, a very slow decrease. In any case, they are all a shrinking population. It's all a situation where the death rate is greater than the birth rate. So now we're gonna talk about a very specific case example. This, well, you know who this is. It's the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. And we have a population of these rabbits somewhere location undisclosed. Of course, you know that a population is all of the members of one species that live in one specific area and are able to interbreed with one another. So we're going to start out with a little bit of information about our rabbit population. Our rabbit population to start in year zero is 75 rabbits. And every year there are 50 rabbits born for every 100 rabbits in the population. And every year, 30 rabbits die for every 100 rabbits in the population. And there's no immigration or emigration. No rabbits enter or leave this population. So for starters, we want to calculate the growth rate. So remember that to get the growth rate, we're going to take the birth rate minus the death rate and divide by 100. So we have 50 minus 30 gives us 20. Divided by 100 gives us a growth rate of 0 0.20. Well, knowing that we have 75 rabbits in the population to start, how many rabbits are we going to add to the population in that first year? Well, 75 rabbits times 0 0.20 gives us 15 new rabbits in the population. Okay, so after the first year, what will our population be? Well, we've got this handy little chart, and we show that in the, after the first year, we have 90 rabbits. Well, that 90 continues to add 0.2% of their population, so we have 108. And that 108 continues to add 0.2% of their population, so we end with 130. By the time we get up to year 11, holy smokes, we got 557 rabbits in this population. 
that's a lot of bunnies. So if we look at the growth rate, and this, remember, is the growth rate that we calculated, we can see that from year one to year 12, that growth rate never changes. So the growth rate is constant. It is unchanging. Now, it also happens to be a positive number. So the growth rate is both constant and it's positive. The population is growing. What does that mean? If you remember from the simulation that you did yesterday, a population that's growing like these rabbits, well, they're experiencing a very special kind of growth. Do you remember what it is? It was one of those vocabulary words. That's right, exponential growth. Now, what does exponential growth look like? Well, it looks like that. Ooh, that's steep. So exponential growth is also sometimes called J-curve growth. And it's called that because, well, okay, you have to use a little bit of imagination here. But it kind of looks like a letter J. I guess more than another kind of letter. So it's called J-curve growth, and do you think that this happens very often in nature? It doesn't. J-curve growth is pretty rare in nature, and when it does happen, it's pretty short-lived. It's the kind of thing we see with bacteria in a petri dish, and that was actually the example that was used, if you recall, in the simulation. Now, in J-curve growth, the birth and death rates don't ever change. So we just keep adding more and more individuals to the population. The birth and death rates remain constant. We continue to add individuals to the population. And boy, that total just keeps going up and up and up. Okay, but there might just be a problem here. So when we talk about our little rabbit population, it turns out that the ecosystem that they live in can only support about 600 rabbits in the long term. Do you remember the term that is the number of individuals that a, a um, ecosystem can support in the long term? 600 rabbits is the carrying capacity of this ecosystem. And when an ecosystem gets to the point of carrying capacity, you know what happens to birth rates? Well, they start to decline. They start to decrease. And while the birth rate starts to decrease, you know what happens to the death rate? <laughs> That's right, the death rate starts to increase. Remember, we've talked about in the past that fertility is linked to being well-nourished, to being in optimal health, to living in those optimal conditions. So, you know, maybe if there aren't quite enough calories, you don't have as big a litters. Or maybe not all your babies make it. Maybe some of them starve to death. Huh. Well, what happens if birth rates decrease and death rates increase? The growth rate decreases. And in some cases, the growth rate actually will become negative, meaning that the population is shrinking. So now we're going to talk about what happens a little bit more closely in the real world. Logistic growth, sometimes called S-curve growth. You have to use a little bit of imagination to see the S there. It's sort of an S that someone sat on. but it looks like this, and S-curve or logistic growth is a little bit different from exponential growth because logistic growth, for the very first time, introduces this new idea, the idea of carrying capacity, the idea that there is a limit to the number of individuals that the environment can support. So this logistic growth model assumes that as a population approaches carrying capacity, the birth and death rates start to change. So since logistic growth assumes that as a population approaches carrying capacity, birth and death rates change, what force does it say that makes this happen? Well, the other concept that logistic growth introduces is the concept of the limiting factor. The logistic growth model proposes that limiting factors are factors that limit population size. Okay, so well, let's go back to our bunnies, shall we? We said that the carrying capacity for our bunnies was 600. I'm sorry, I mean eastern cottontails. And if we look 
up through year 11, all is well. We are under carrying capacity. But then in year 13, something happens. Hmm. We are over carrying capacity for this population. So what do we reach in year 12? Well, we reach the carrying capacity. And let's look at the growth rate from years 0 to 12. From year 0 to year 12, the growth rate is a positive 0.2. But something happens in year 13, the year where we've gone over the carrying capacity. Suddenly, the growth rate is actually a negative number. Ooh, well, that's not good. So what happens? Well, the population declines. So in year 13, the growth rate is actually negative. But once we have that one year with a negative growth rate, we're back under carrying capacity. And guess what? In year 14, the growth rate is positive again. So every time the population rises above the carrying capacity, the growth rate goes negative. It doesn't necessarily last long. Very often we have one year with a negative growth rate, we drop below carrying capacity, and it's followed by a year with a positive growth rate. But we really just can't support more than 600 rabbits in this ecosystem. So I've done a really sloppy job of graphing the population of these rabbits over time, and I've gotten up to somewhere close to year 12. And it's in year 12, of course, that we finally go over the carrying capacity. So then what happens? We start to see things drop and rise and drop and rise and drop and rise and drop and rise and drop and rise. You'll do a better job when you graph it. But the population is fluctuating up there. Well, if we draw a line at the carrying capacity, what we find is that it's fluctuating around that carrying capacity. Now, we happen to know in this case that the carrying capacity is 600. But what if you didn't know that? What if you were given a graph of a population size over time and were asked to identify the carrying capacity? Could you do it? Well, yeah, of course you could. You would look, because you're clever critters, you would look for the range where that population is fluctuating. And you would sort of shoot a line right down the middle of it, knowing that every time it goes above carrying capacity, it's going to drop, and once it bottoms out, it's going to rise again. If you have questions, now's a good time to ask them. As a matter of fact, if you have additional questions, write them down, email them to me. Put a private note in Classroom when you submit this. So what is it that causes the population to fall every time it gets up above carrying capacity? Well, it's this last word, this last idea that we introduced with the logistic growth model, limiting factors. And we said that limiting factors were factors that limit the size of a population. So let's think about this. If we have all these rabbits crowded into an isolated field and they can't get out, what's going to start killing them? Well, a lot of people said um, they're going to run out of food. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to eat themselves out of house and home. They might, you know, not in the case of rabbits, but in the case of bacteria in a petri dish, drown in their own waste. What if you've got a fish tank that, and, you know, the snails just keep reproducing and keep reproducing? Eventually, their waste products are going to make the water uninhabitable, and it's going to start killing them. Ah! So let me ask you, do factors like that kill more individuals in a population that looks like this or in a population that looks like that. Does population density matter? Well, for some limiting factors it does. So density dependent limiting factors are those factors that only kick in and start to limit the size of the population when it's near, what's that magic number? Carrying capacity. So when the population has grown to be near or at carrying capacity, 
density dependent limiting factors start to play a role in limiting the population. So are there any factors that would limit the population even if they're not very crowded, even if they're low density? Well, what about something like a flood or a fire that just kills a bunch of individuals and it doesn't matter how closely spaced they are? Aha! Density independent limiting factors can affect populations even when they're low density, even when they're not crowded. Things again like fires and floods where density dependent factors affect populations that are more crowded, that are more dense, that are at or near carrying capacity. Things like food shortages or shortages of nesting sites. Okay, the follow-up to everything that we've done. You have six air test questions, three from the practice test, one each from spring 16, 17, and 19. You will go to the Ohio Air Test student practice site. You will complete these questions. You have to do it in Safari, just like you've been doing all along. Screenshot your responded completed question. And if you're using the slides version of this, I've left you six and maybe one extra, blank slides at the end. You'll just put an image of your air test question in the slide show, and then you'll submit the whole thing. Easy peasy. If you're doing this on PDF, you'll still do the questions and take a screenshot, but you will submit your screenshots just as six separate images. If you have questions, please email me. Thanks.